Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the regular meeting of the Public Works and Infrastructure Committee for March 2nd, 2023. I'm Andrew Johnson, and I'm the chair of this committee. And at this time, I will ask the clerk to call the roll so we can verify that we have a quorum for this meeting. Councilmember Payne. Present. Wansley. Present. Vita. Present. Chugtai. Present. Vice Chair Koski. Present. Chair Johnson. Present. There are six members present. Let the record reflect that we have a quorum. With that, the agenda for today's meeting is before us, and there are two items on the consent agenda, which I'll read for the record. The item number five is designating the Mill District Street Resurfacing Project, receiving the cost estimate and setting a public hearing for April 20th, 2023. And item number six is updating the parking and mobility service fee and rate schedule to incorporate fees related to the Street Cafe program. Is there any discussion on the consent agenda or are there any items that anyone would like to pull for discussion? I am not seeing any, so I'll move approval of the consent agenda. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those, those opposed say nay. The ayes have it and the consent agenda is approved. Next, we'll move on to our public hearings for the day. And our first is the 46th Avenue South Street resurfacing, project approval, and assessments. Director Anderson Kelleher, who will be presenting on this item? Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. Larry Masamoto, who is Principal Professional Engineer in Transportation, Maintenance, and Repair. Thank you. Welcome, Mr. Masamoto. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the Public Works Infrastructure Committee. My name is Larry Masamoto, and I am a Principal Professional Engineer in Public Works. And, am I, and I am here to present to you three public hearings. The first is 46th Avenue South resurfacing project and to recommend passage of a resolution ordering the work to proceed in adopting special assessments in the amount of $324,240.45 for 46th Avenue South resurfacing project and to recommend passage of a resolution requesting the Board of Estimation and Taxation to authorize the city's issuance and sale of assessment bonds in the amount of $324,240.45 for the project. 46th Avenue South is a municipal state aid street bounded by 38th Street and 46th Street East. The street was reconstructed in 1971, 1969, and has a pavement condition index of 71. This was a 2022 ADA ped ramp project area and 25 corners are planned to be upgraded along with minor gas company main work and services uh, to be performed this year. Public Works hosted a virtual meeting on Tuesday, February 21st at 6.30 p.m. with 378 invitations mailed. There were five people attending the meeting. The questions were general in nature and on the assessment and scope of work for the roadway. On November 17th, City Council designated the improvements of the proposed 2023 street resurfacing program. The purpose of the asphalt pavement resurfacing program is to extend the life of some city streets which are not scheduled for any preventative maintenance, renovation, or reconstruction in the foreseeable future. This resurfacing program is addressing city streets that are at their point in the life cycle where a new street surface will extend the street's life, improve the quality, the neighborhood livability and help slow the overall deterioration of the street system. The 2023 resurfacing program is identified in the 20 year streets funding plan and is included in the capital improvement program. Transportation maintenance repair coordinates with transportation planning and program on any bikes facilities within this program. The proposed street resurfacing assessments were determined by applying the 2023 uniform assessment rate to the land area benefited parcels located within the street influence zone and along improved streets. These assessments are not calculated based on the project costs alone. The city uses a formula that combines the influence area with the annually established uniform assessment rate. This formula is carefully considered and applied to by city staff and is intended to account for and reflect each project value to the benefited properties. The information has been provided in notices on how persons may prepay the special assessments in full without interest if they so choose. The City Council has passed resolutions whereby a deferment 
of special assessments may be obtained by showing hardship for any homestead or property owner by a, or by a person 65 years of age or older or retired by virtue of a permanent and total disability. This concludes my presentation and I am available for questions. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. And I'm not seeing any questions from colleagues. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and open the public hearing and ask the clerk if anyone has signed up to speak on this. Seeing a head shake, no. So I will see if anyone is here to speak on this who did not sign up. Anyone? Anyone, anyone? All right, I'm gonna go ahead and close the public hearing. And uh, I'm um, not seeing any other questions from council members. And so therefore I will move approval of this item. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay, the ayes have it. And that will be forwarded to the full council meeting next week. And next we'll move on to our second public hearing, which is consideration of the Minnehaha Residential Street Resurfacing Project, Director Anderson Keller, who will be presenting on this. Mr. Chair, Mr. Masamoto will continue on this presentation. All right, please proceed, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the Public Works Infrastructure Committee, I am here to present to you the Minnehaha Residential Resurfacing Project and recommend resolution ordering the work to proceed and adopting special assessments in the amount of $928,000 $42.44 for the Minnehaha Residential Resurfacing Project and to recommend passage of a resolution requesting the Board of Estimation and Taxation to authorize the city's issuance and sale of assessment bonds in the amount of $928,042.44 for the project. Minnehaha Residential are local streets bounded by 49th Street East to 54th Street East 40th Avenue South to 50th Avenue South. This project was originally reconstructed in 1982 and has a pavement condition index of 57. This was in the 2022 ADA ped ramp project and at that time 96 corners were upgraded along with some gas company work. Public Works planned an in-person meeting on Wednesday, February 22nd at seven o'clock at Key Waden. However, due to the winter storm and the, the facilities were closed by the Minneapolis Park and Rec Board, so this was changed to a virtual meeting. Notices went out to the council and the neighborhood organizations. Public Works mailed 1,004 invitations and there were four people that did attend this meeting. On November 17th, 2022, the city council designated the improvements of, of the proposed 2023 street resurfacing program the purpose of the asphalt pavement resurfacing program is to extend the life of some city streets which are not scheduled for preventative maintenance, renovation, or reconstruction in the foreseeable future. This resurfacing program is addressing city streets that are at their point in their life cycle where a new street surface will extend the street's life, improve the ride quality and the neighborhood livability, and help slow the overall deterioration of our city street system. The 2023 resurfacing program is identified in the 20 year streets funding plan and was included in the capital improvement program. The proposed street resurfacing special assessments were determined in, by applying the 2023 uniform assessment rates to the land of the benefited parcels located within the street influence zone along the improved streets. These assessments are not calculated based on the project cost alone. The city uses a formula that combines influence area with an annually established uniform assessment rate. This formula is carefully, carefully considered by, and applied by city staff and is intended to account for and reflect each project's value to the benefited properties. Information has been provided and notices on how, to, how persons may prepay the special assessments in full without interest if they so choose. The city council has passed resolutions whereby a deferment of special assessments may be obtained by showing hardship for any homestead or property owned by a person 65 years of age or older or retired by virtue of a permanent and total disability. This concludes my presentation and I am available for questions. Thank you for the presentation. I'm not seeing any questions from colleagues, so I'll go ahead and open the public hearing. We do uh, have one person signed up to speak, Patricia Larson. 
please come on up. And uh, we uh, have a two-minute timer that we do, um, but I guess that I won't, won't be a problem. Minutes. I'm guessing that won't be a problem. Please welcome. Hi, thank you. Thank you for this chance to talk to this committee. My name is Trish Larson, and I am the Church Council Secretary of Trinity Lutheran Church in Minnehaha Falls. Trinity is a church in the Minnehaha residential area, and we received an assessment for this project of more than $58,000. The pastor and president of the church council submitted a letter to this group, and I'm here as a representative of the church. You have the letter for consideration and additional details, but to summarize a few key points, the $58,000 assessment is about 10% of our revenue which for a church comes from members and attenders who give their money. Uh, the property has been categorized as a business for the purposes of calculating the assessment, but we don't operate like a business that can raise prices or deduct these costs as a business expense. We love our neighborhood and we've been there for 100 years this year. We host neighborhood events, contribute to local businesses, perform ministry and service works. We're also a precinct polling location. We love contributing to this neighborhood and we're happy to contribute to this road project, but we ask that this dollar amount be reduced. And that's it. Thank you, You're appreciate welcome. it. All right, is there anyone else here to speak who did not sign up on this item? Anyone else not seeing any? I'll go ahead and uh, close the public hearing and just see maybe from our staff if there's any commentary around uh, how uh, church organizations are handled with this. Is there any, are they treated as businesses? Is this typical? And I'll just uh, add my own commentary. Welcome, come on up, that this is probably the first time I've heard of uh, uh, faith-based organization reaching out about their assessments, so I wanted to ask the question and, and get that out there publicly. Thank you. Good afternoon, committee members, Chair Johnson, uh, Paul Keating, Special Assessment Supervisor in Transportation Engineering Design. Uh, nonprofit entities and uh, tax-exempt entities are subject to special assessments uh, regardless of their tax-exempt status, the special assessments are still levied against them. Um, in the case of this particular property, this is actually a mixed-use parcel. So part of the calculation was based on residential and part of it was based on non-residential. The same methodology is applied using the influence area and the square footage of the parcel. The parcel is a very large parcel. It's about half a city block and that's where the high dollar amount comes from because the uniform assessment rate is uniform. The only distinction there is the square footage. Gotcha, so. thank you, I appreciate that. And I would just recommend uh, having a chance to connect with staff as well if there's any concerns around how this is calculated and looking at the assessment uh, amount as well. So thank you. I'll see if there's any comments or questions from fellow committee members. If not, I will go ahead and move this item to our full council. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, say nay. And that uh, will move on to our full council and meeting next week. And we now turn to our next public hearing, which is on the Park Avenue South Street Resurfacing Project, Director Anderson Keller will be presenting on this. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. Mr. Masamoto will continue on Park Avenue Resurfacing. All right, welcome. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon again, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Uh, I am here to present to you Park Avenue South Resurfacing Project and recommend the passage of a resolution ordering the work to proceed and adopting a special assessment in the amount of $102,799.56 for Park Avenue South resurfacing project and recommend passage of a resolution requesting the Board of Estimation and Taxation to authorize the city's issuance and sale of assessment bonds in the amount of $102,799.56 for the project. 
Park Avenue South is a municipal state aid street and it is bounded by 46th Street East and Minnehaha Parkway East. The street was reconstructed in 1960 and has a pavement condition index of 61. This was a 2022 ADA ped ramp improvement project area and 13 corners were upgraded along with minor gas company main work and services performed in 2022. Public Works had planned an in-person meeting on Thursday, February 23rd at the McRae Rec Center at seven o'clock. However, due to the winter storm at the last minute, this was changed to a virtual meeting. The project website was changed to reflect the meeting web link. Notices went out to the council and the neighborhood organizations. 111 invitations were mailed and there were no participants in this meeting. <clears throat> On November 17th, 2022, City Council designated the improvements of the proposed 2023 street resurfacing program. The purpose of the asphalt pavement resurfacing program is to extend the life of some city streets which are not scheduled for any preventative maintenance, renovation, or reconstruction in the foreseeable future. The renovation, the resurfacing program is addressing city streets that are at their point in the life cycle where a new surface will extend the street's life improve ride quality and neighborhood livability, and help slow the overall deterioration of our city street system. The 2023 resurfacing program is identified in the 20-year streets funding plan and was included in the capital improvement program. Transportation maintenance and repair coordinates with transportation planning and program on any bike facilities within this program. The proposed street resurfacing special assessments were determined by applying the 2023 uniform assessment rate to the land area of benefited parcels located within the street influence zone along with improved streets. These assessments are now calculated based on the project cost alone. The city uses a formula that combines influence area with an annually established uniform assessment rate. This formula carefully considers and applies by city staff and is intended to account for and reflect each project's value to the benefited properties. Information has been provided on notices as how do persons may prepay the special assessments in full without interest if they so choose. The City Council has passed resolutions whereby a deferment of special assessments may be obtained by showing hardship for any homesteaded property owned by a person's 65 years of age or older or retired by virtue of a permanent and total disability. This concludes my final presentation and I am available for questions. Thank you for the presentation. And I'm not seeing any questions from colleagues. I'll turn to the clerk and see if anyone signed up to speak on this. Seeing a head shake, no. So I'll see if anyone in the room is interested in speaking on this item. Anyone not seeing anyone? So I uh, can't remember if I opened the public hearing. So I'm gonna open the public hearing not seeing anyone here to speak on it, I am going to go ahead and close the public hearing. And still not seeing any questions from colleagues, I'll go ahead and move this item uh, for approval. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, say nay. That motion carries. And finally, we'll move on uh, to our last public hearing of the day, which is considering the Hennepin Avenue South Streetscape project. Director Anderson Keller, who will be presenting on this item. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. Adam Hayhow, who is Senior Professional Engineer in Transportation Engineering and Design. Welcome, Mr. Hayhow. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Adam Hayhow. I'm a Senior Professional Engineer in our Transportation Engineering Design Division uh, of Public Works. Today, I'm here presenting for the public hearing for Hennepin Avenue in Hass Streetscape, City Project Number 67. Seven six. There are two proposed enhanced streetscape projects that will be incorporated into the Hennepin Avenue reconstruction project. Uh, the first project is located in the Uptown Special Service District between Lake Street and 28th Street West. The second project is located in the Lowry Hill Special Service District between 28th Street and Franklin Avenue West. Each special service district has its own enhanced streetscape design and related special assessments. The Hennepin Avenue project will pay for the base streetscape. Uh, the base elements includes city standard street lights, larger three inch trees, bicycle racks, benches, stormwater planter beds, 
and trash and recycling receptacles. The scope of the enhanced streetscape was developed in coordination with the spe each special service district boards. Once the recommended design was identified, public works offered and conducted three open house meetings to provide information regarding, regarding the proposed enhancements, as well as individual property assessments. Uh, for the uptown district, the enhanced streetscape includes all pedestrian scale lights, festoon electrical system, irrigation system, perennial planter beds, and decorative fencing around planters. For the Lowry Hill District, the enhanced streetscape includes festoon electrical system, irrigation system, district banners, and decorative fencing around planters. The total enhanced streetscape cost is $1,040,000. Um, the uptown uh, streetscape assessment is $440,000. Uh, this is based on lineal street frontage and comes to $218.16 per lineal foot. Uh, for the, the total Lowry streetscape assessment is $600,000. This is also based on lineal street frontage and comes to $76.40 per linear foot. Both assessments are payable over a 20 year period. Uh, a virtual pre-assessment meeting was held on, Jan on February 21st to discuss the plan improvements and answer any questions related to the assessment method. Uh, today, uh, Public Works is asking City Council to pass resolutions ordering the work to proceed, adopting, adopting the special assessments and authorizing the sale of assessment bonds. And that concludes my presentation. I'll stand by for any questions. Thank you for the presentation, Mr. Hayo. Uh, I am gonna see if there are any questions from committee members. Not, oh, uh, Council Member Payne. Uh, thank you, Chair Johnson. Uh, do you know if any notices were sent out for community engagement that I missed that I missed that on this or not? Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, uh, member, Council Member Payne, yes, they were yeah, sent out as yeah. for the open houses, yes. Did, did you know that, uh, I, I was just tracking the results. I have like a follow-up question on just like what our history is for turnout because it's all kind of relatively under 2% and I'm just curious as how we can improve that. Not that you specifically okay. know the answer, but if you do know the answer for the specific numbers that went out and how many uh, uh, residents participated, that'd be great. Okay. Uh, Council Member Payne, uh, so for, for the diff two different districts, uh, for the Lowry Hill, there was, um, there's 80 properties. Uh, that was uh, invites were mailed out to 80 properties. Um, and then for the Uptown Special Service District, there was 283 letters or invites mailed out for that district. And for the three open houses, they were lightly attended. There wasn't a lot of people that attended those meetings. Uh, and there were those three separate meetings. Thank you. All right, thank you. Any other questions from council members? Not seeing any, I will go ahead and open the public hearing. Thank you for the presentation. And I turn to our clerk and I'm seeing a head shake, no, no one signed up to speak. So I'll just ask one more time, is anyone here to speak on this item who is not signed up? Not seeing any, I will go ahead and close this public hearing. I don't see any further questions from colleagues. So I will go ahead and move approval of this item. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. That carries. And now we'll move on to our discussion items today. Our first item is uh, approving a slate of items related to the public infrastructure improvements and district stormwater system for the Upper Harbor Terminal Project. Director Anderson Kelleher, who will be presenting on this item. Mr. Chair and committee members, it's a rare day that we get to welcome CPED to Public Works, but we're gonna have two presenters, uh, Director of Economic Planning, uh, Economic Policy and Development in CPED, Eric Hansen will begin. And then uh, Mr. Dodds, the Deputy Director and City Engineer from Public Works will continue the presentation. Great. Well, welcome, Mr. Hansen. We're happy uh, to have you here, even though this isn't the committee you typically are at. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, it's an honor to be here. It's my first time in front of you, uh, in front of this committee, and I'm here um, in partnership with my colleagues in Public Works and the City Attorney's Office to present a series of actions for the next phase of the Upper Harbor. 
As you know, uh, for context, for those that are unfamiliar, the Upper Harbor is about a 50-acre site that the city owns in the McKinley neighborhood in North Minneapolis that has been in this, that it was a former barging terminal, terminal that has been in the planning stages for decades. At the end of 2021, those decades of planning came to an end with the approval of the coordinated plan. The coordinated plan establishes what is going to happen at the Upper Harbor. On the screen, you'll see over $350 million of development into uh, investment into development of infrastructure, housing, a music venue, commercial and community developments, a regional park, and the reclamation of one mile of the Mississippi Riverfront. Guiding the coordinated plan is our community focused visions, which identifies and maximizes community benefits. The actions in front of you further this vision and these benefits. Today's recommended actions will advance infrastructure, construction and preparation for that uh, started last year, and it will allow for a district stormwater system. In a minute, I will turn it over to the city engineer who will discuss the infrastructure actions um, and the related, the related action um, uh, related to that, and then I'll turn it back over to me and I'll s discuss more about the, the stormwater. And at the end of the presentation, we can answer more of your questions because we have a larger team, uh, because with the Upper Harbor, we always run in a large team. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Mr. Dodds. All right. Welcome. We'll Mr. talk Dodds. about the infrastructure. Thank you, Eric. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Johnson, members of the committee, Brian Dodds, Deputy Director, City Engineer for Public Works. Glad to be here today. This is an exciting project. Uh, so many people are involved, uh, such a great partnership. We've got federal funds, state funds, uh, watershed, uh, park board, Hennepin County, et cetera, et cetera. There's just so many players and so many parts to this, and it's just an exciting project. So I will be talking about the infrastructure and the work that we've done this year, as well as talk about what we're gonna be doing next year. And uh, this has been a great partnership, the work this year with CPED and the Park Board. And so we did kind of three phases this year. We removed the trees, did some clearing and grubbing. Uh, we worked on the rail spur, worked with uh, Canadian Pacific, on removing the rail spur out there, both the track and the ties, as well as doing some demolition of, of building and grading of the site. So this is our first picture. This was earlier in the year. We're removing the tracks. Uh, kind of an interesting contract we have that you approved. Um, very, we did not have to pay much. The value of steel was so high that uh, we, we uh, had actually came in way under budget uh, because they could salvage the steel rail that was out there. Um, so, it's good. Uh, here's a picture of our uh, dome demolition. Three domes out there, and the one nearest to you, you can see the top of the egg is cracked, and mm -hmm. it's starting to come down. We have a long arm excavator there in the near, uh, in the front of the picture that, that worked to take that down. You can see the two other domes uh, behind the grain silos there, and uh, part of the upper right dome remains, and I'll point that out in the next picture. Um, beyond that was the warehouse facility and then just the rest of the site down towards Lowry. So here's a view of the southern part of the site. Uh, we can see GAF, we can see Libra there in the right. And uh, this used to be an area of parking lots. Uh, we used to have a large berm um, uh, buffering the site from the river. That berm was removed. We did um, a lot of shoreline restoration along there. You can see the green material is hydro mulch, and so it's seed and mulch that's actually sprayed onto the dirt to uh, keep erosion from happening and uh, reestablish the turf there. Uh, this also shows the rough grading of the future parkway that's, that's along this area. Mm. Here we are looking north, and we're looking at about half of the warehouse is removed. Um, the, two northerly, uh, the northerly dome is gone. Uh, the southeasterly dome is gone, and then just the base of the last remaining dome is there, and that's going to remain in place and be a feature in the park that's uh, going to be out there. And here's my last slide on 2022. You can see this is, you can see Dowling on the left side of the screen, and this is looking on uh, the northerly part of the project. Uh, in the middle of the screen is our construction trailer that our staff spent the summer in. 
And then uh, great uh, additional shoreline restoration. You can see the black topsoil there that we have not done the hydro mulching and hydro seeding on. And then uh, the alignment of the parkway that's, that's coming to uh, fruition there. Uh, not yet paved, but at least it's graded out as of last year. We do have a little bit more of the site grading to do this spring before the bulk of the contract begins for 23. So talking about 23, we've got three uh, different projects there. We've got the reconstruction of Dowling Avenue. That's a federal project that starts from Lindale and heads down to the river, connecting in with the new parkway. We've got the new parkway, uh, phase one, that starts on the northerly limits of the project, about two blocks north of Dowling, uh, upstream of Dowling, and then going down to the music venue and being cul de sac there. And then we also have uh, the 33rd Avenue reconstruction project that goes from 2nd and connects into um, the future um, parkway that's phase two. Again, that phase two part is not being done at right now. That's being, uh, that'll be funded and constructed in the future. Uh, these, these connections are um, gonna provide a great pedestrian and bicycle environment. They're doing enhancements to both of those, additional lighting out there. It's just gonna be a great and much enhanced connection for, to, from North Minneapolis to the river and to this greater project area. Uh, here's a, a rough layout of, of costs for each of those. We do have a more detailed breakdown uh, in the fiscal note that's in the RCA. And then here's uh, a rough run through of again our, our funding sources, but again, a more detailed list is in the RCA. So I'm gonna turn it back to Eric. Thank you, Brian. The more complicated component of this uh, report is a district stormwater system. District stormwater system is a rarely used um, management uh, series and networks of best management practices across multiple public and private uh, properties that manage and treat stormwater. And as part of the coordinated plan, um, the, um, the objective was to do that across the entire 50 acre site of the Upper Harbor. And you'll see a series of pipes and cisterns and trenches and ephemeral streams um, that manage stormwater across all of the different parcels, um, the approximately 10 parcels and the park um, in the Upper Harbor. The importance of this district stormwater at the base is to strive to keep costs lower for all of the participants in the system than they would, than they would have if they individually went ahead and managed their own stormwater system while providing additional amenities to the, um, uh, to the, to the Upper Harbor site. In order for us to, to enter and to build and manage this system, we have to enter into what is called a reciprocal easement and operating agreement, an REOA, which articulates the roles and responsibilities of the partners in the systems. I'm gonna move, I could come back to this as I notice you're watching it, but I'll go back to the partners. The partners in this system are the city, the Mississippi Watershed Management Organization, or the MWMO, the park board, and our development partners, United Properties and First Avenue. The REO aid will define what is gonna be built in the system, by whom and where, the capital costs, the operating costs, and how those are paid, who administers, administers the system, how future replacements are covered, and other requisite contract terms that we um, will generally have around insurance, liabilities, and other things. This REOA is the result of, and I'm not kidding you, thousands of hours of negotiations between the five parties. And I wanna recognize not only the, my colleagues in public works that help with the technical aspects, because this is way above my technical expertise about what should be built, but our city attorney, um, most notably Shelly Rowe, who had our attorneys group in this, um, uh, in this effort, where there was multiple days, day-long sessions to get to this point. This is a very important component of the Upper Harbor, but is very complicated to get to this point. So we're very excited as a team to be in front of you because that means we're done. 
So the overall benefits of this, in, in addition to cost savings, is efficiency and management, creation of habitat, decreasing pollution, treating and reusing stormwater on the site, and uh, connecting to public, sa public spaces. We're also looking at opportunities to do regional management of stormwater. As you know, this is right on the river. And so the Public Works Department is, has an option to be managing water from off the Upper Harbor site as a component of this system. Um, and they're working with the MWMO around that. So there's, there's added advantages of this uh, district stormwater, all in the, um, the hope to not only manage the stormwater, but to, to keep the, the river cleaner. So in uh, the report, actions two through seven provide the authority for us to enter into it. So there's a number of actions um, that articulate our roles, not only just entering into the REOA, but accepting some funding and um, uh, um, appropriating that funding so we can use it. So first of all, how does this place get built, the system get built? Each developer, uh, as they take down a parcel, uh, will build their component of the system. They are going to spend, they're going to, the REOA articulates how much money they will spend on that system and then also dictates how much they would put into an operation maintenance fund as this system is uh, up and running. Since it's not all going to be built at the same time, the MWMO is going to be providing the city a phasing loan with, to, in the amount of about $3 million. And the way that phasing loan is set up is in some cases, it would cost you, some parcels cost less than you would do it as kind of going alone. And so what they would do is construct their uh, elements on their property and then they would contribute to the phasing loan. In other parcels, you'll pay a lot more than you would have done it if you were gone alone and they would go to the city and then the city would pay that extra cost as the, as the system gets built out. There's a, there's a loan to the city that has no interest, but that loan at the, end of this, at the end of the term when everything is built out, if there is a balance, the MWMO would forgive it. So the city acts as a kind of a financial steward to help it get built, uh, but it's the MWMO that's, uh, that's pointing up the money to help us get this through. The MWMO has been a significant partner to the city in this effort. Their board has um, designated $13 million for this effort. Uh, they're putting in a number of enhancements at the cost of the MWMO. They're helping to seed the replacement reserves and the operational shortfalls in the early years, and they're being the system administrator on behalf of the system until the end of 2030. That gives us an opportunity to operationalize the system build it out, find out what the best practices are for, for maintenance, use their expertise, and then at the end of 2030, that, um, arrange, that uh, responsibility will come to the city and in CPED. Public Works would have a role as a technical advisor, helping us with what should be done in, as far as maintenance and operations as we modify that in the out years. Um, and, sit, and CPED would operate as, as, as the property owner, as we are leasing all the properties uh, except for the park board property, and uh, manage that uh, that contract through um, through our um, real estate development group. All right. So I've come to the end of my presentation, as the slide shows, um, and we'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. All right, Councilmember Vita. No questions, but just thank you. Thank you for all of the work and to all of the partners. As someone who sits on the MWMO, you know, I, this is my second time hearing about how extensive this partnership is, but I'm grateful for it and grateful for all the work. Looking forward to what's going to happen in 2023. I will say, uh, Director Dodds, those photos were amazing to see you. Like, I walk over there, but you can't see it in the way that you just showed it. So thank you all for the hard work. As the council member who represents this project, I am happy to be here for CPED and Public Works and whomever um, to support whatever we need in the future. So thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Payne. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I, I think I have like a possible combo legal and technical question. 
I know that there was some contention at the beginning of this process of, with community and you know what the state of the environmental impact of the project was. I know that was navigated the court system. And now that we're in the process of reconstruction, I'm wondering uh, to what extent environmental remediation is a part of the project and, like, and to what extent re remediation was necessary as part of the project. Mr. Chair, Council Member Payne, the city has a phase one and phase two of the, um, um, the property. We will clean up um, the elements. We are uncovering, as you will with any un development, we will uncover things we did not know about as we go along. And it's um, our commitment as with all of our projects to make sure that we clean up any of the contamination. Um, the stormwater system that we presented today is to address some of those environmental concerns to make sure that we are um, more efficiently and effectively managing the water as it comes into the in, into the site and then therefore into the river. Will we have any um, ongoing reporting of any discoveries that maybe weren't weren't known at the outset that now we need to start addressing? Well, like how will the community know about yeah. those types of developments? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Council Member Payne, we. We will be uncovering those, and then we'll have uh, response action plans for each of the elements we, we for each of the developments as they come online. Um, they'll, um, those will be on our website. We have every single environmental document that we've created for the Upper Harbor on the uh, project's website, so it's available to the public at any point in time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Vice Chair Koski. Thank you, Chair Johnson. Just a quick question regarding the reuse of the stormwater. Can you just help me understand how do we reuse the stormwater or what, what, would, what will it be used for? All right. Um, Chair Johnson, Vice Chair Koski, this is the point of the, of the presentation where I look to the people with the expertise in the group from Public Works to come up and talk about water. I'm glad I stated that this was past my expertise. Jeremy? Good afternoon, council members. Uh, my name is Jeremy Strelo. I'm a senior professional engineer with Public Works Service Water and Sewers. Uh, so getting to the question of how the reuse is planned for the site, um, this was part of MWMO's kind of vision for the property and, and the development in the region or the district system. Uh, so as of now, their plan is to collect the stormwater and then the main point of reuse through the site is going to be there's uh, some what they call <laughs> ephemeral streams through the site. Uh, so these are a couple of kind of surface swales features that they'll direct the stormwater into. And their goal with that is to create an environment, a habitat for macro invertebrates uh, to kind of flourish. And then those, uh, as the system kind of works, those make their way into the river to kind of provide uh, some beneficial um, uh, activities into the river as well. So uh, for right now, that's the plan for the reuse. Like I said, it's uh, so there'll be kind of uh, intermittent streams flowing through the site um, as they're pumping it to the surface. It flows through there. And like I said, it creates kind of an environment to, to facilitate those macro invertebrates. Thank you. Fascinating. <laughs> All right. And, and technical question, you mean big bugs, right? By macro invertebrates or... Uh, I am not the uh, expert on macroinvertebrates, uh, but right. they are bugs, All right. yes. <laughs> All right. How big, I don't know. I'm, I'm All right. not that making any good. guarantees. All right, that sounds good. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Council, uh, or uh, Vice Chair. Uh, I am not seeing any other questions, so I'll just echo the thanks and appreciation for this. It's clearly complex work. I mean, it's it's... Uh, much more work than the easier path probably of just everybody kind of going it alone, but clearly there's a huge benefit uh, not only for this whole project area, but the environment as well. And so we really appreciate this innovative approach and are, are very happy with uh, all of this. And thank you again for the presentation. All right. And we don't have any more left on this item, right? Uh, we'd this... like you to move oh. the... Besides moving approval, go. yes. Yes, please. All right, thank you. Perfect. Well, I'm not seeing any other questions or comments at this time, so I'll go ahead and move approval of this item. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, say nay.
ayes have it and that item is uh, recommended to the council next we'll move on to our parklet and street cafe programs discussion director anderson kelleher who will be presenting on this item Thank you, Mr. Chair. Today presenting will be Amy Barnsdorf, Transportation Planner, and Lex Brand, Associate Transportation Planner, Transportation Planning and Programming. And Lex is going to begin. Welcome, Lex. Good afternoon, Chair Johnson, Council Members. My name is Lex Brand, Associate Transportation Planner um, in Public Works Transportation Planning and Programming. I'm here with my colleague, Amy Barnstorff, to provide an updated overview uh, of the Parklet and Street Cafe programs. As a part of this presentation, we're, gonna, uh, we're going to uh, present this overview of the program, uh, what changes have been done to the pilot to create the permanent program, and a quick overview of the future updates. This pilot program was established in 2014 um, with three city-owned parklets that are being used to spark interest in this initiative. These structures represent a low barrier of entry to these programs. And as a counterpart or, or, or a partner to this program, we launched the Street Cafe pilot program in 2016. Now, to the obvious question, what is a parklet? Um, a parklet is a public space where commercial activities are not permitted. A street cafe, on the other, on the other side, hand, uh, can be exactly the same structure, but it has the permits to seat customers and seat and serve customers for a business. So it's essentially a structure on the public right of way. Now, what they have in common is that they both transform underutilized street space into a public amenity. So we're transforming what used to be two parking spaces into a public amenity. Now, what are the goals of these programs? We want to make the city more livable. We want to make, the, make it more beautiful. We want to transform these street spaces into vibrant public spaces. At the same time, we want to support business communities and create inviting spaces for people interaction. So we want to turn parking into people spaces. Now, as I mentioned before, this pilot program has been running for many years. We gathered public feedback from applicants and hosts and every single response was, was positive. They said, it's a welcome addition to the neighborhood. It increases the visibility of my business. It provides much more benefit than the benefit of just having the parking space. And in the map on your screen on the right side, you're gonna see a quick map of all the parklets and street cafes that we've seen over the years since 2014. Now, with that feedback, we also saw some challenges. And from those, we learned some lessons, of course. Now, the city-owned parklets that we have uh, are not feasible on high-volume streets with narrow parking lanes. Therefore, we would um, suggest the applicants that they could bring their own structures. Now, the problem is that building that own, their own structure and storing them would present a large, um, a significant cost barrier. You have to pay for the structure, you have to have somewhere to store it during the winter. Um, and also, when the, parkings, the parking spots were hooded, or sorry, were metered, um, you would have to ask for meter hooding, which is, it has a significant fee, um, which is daily, and if you multiply by the entire summer, or not the tundra season, is significant. So all of those, um, all of those 
factors would make um, hosting a parklet hard and very expensive for some communities and some businesses. Now, my, to take these lessons learned and go into um, what we did by taking this feedback and improving the process, uh, my colleague Amy Barnstorff will now go over the details. Welcome, Amy. Thank you, Lex, and thank you, uh, Chair Johnson and Council Members. Um, so as Lex pointed out, we've, we've learned a lot over the last several years, um, and as part of that learning process, we are looking to establish these as permanent seasonal programs um, rather than the pilot programs that they've been over the last several years. So why is this important? Um, we've learned a lot. We, um, we've had a lot of successes, we've had a lot of challenges, and really we want to build upon those successes, successes and we also want to uh, address the challenges that we've heard to make sure that these programs remain um, as understandable and as, as accessible as possible to our community members just to make sure that we are, we're having good programs that are useful for our community members. This, route, uh, this work is also rooted in the Transportation Action Plan, um, as identified in trans the Design to Action 2.4 in the Transportation Action Plan to establish the Parklet and Street Cafe programs as permanent seasonal programs. So the goal of establishing these, as we've talked through a bit already, is to solidify the um, different program requirements and uh, program processes based on what we've learned over the last several years. Um, the root of this work is really to create more under a more understandable and more accessible program for our community members um, by removing any unnecessary barriers um, to entry. Lastly, we want to make sure that we are properly planning and budgeting for the future of these programs to make sure that they can continue on successfully well into the future. So with these, uh, with the establishment of these programs as permanent programs, there are a few changes that we are looking to make. Um, a few that I will highlight today, first being the structure requirements for our parklets and street cafes. So historically, we have always required our parklets and street cafes to be at sidewalk level and have a platform. Um, through conversations that we've had with folks um, that have been applying to the program, we've, we've heard that this can be oftentimes, sometimes a cost barrier um, to be able to actually build the structure and store that structure. And so what we're looking to do with this update is to allow, in addition to the sidewalk level uh, structures, we are allowing per, uh, street level parklets and street cafes. Um, in 2020 and 2021, we saw this flexibility um, allowed during the um, indoor dining restrictions with the COVID-19 pandemic, and we saw a welcomed, that, that flexibility was really welcomed by the community members. And so we want to do this on a more permanent basis um, and formalize it as part of this program. In addition to allowing street level parklets and street cafes, we are also adding in some safety requirements, uh, particularly for parklets and street cafes on high injury streets and on uh, for street level street level street cafes and parklets uh, on streets with speed limits 25 miles an hour or higher. And so an example of what those safety barriers might look like is in the image in the lower right hand. Um, these are called J barriers, so something just to ensure the safety of um, our community members who are enjoying that space, particularly on roads with demonstrated crash histories or higher speeds. In addition to the uh, structural requirement change, there's also some changes that we're making to the program fees. Um, historically, we have always waived lane use and meter fees for all of our parklets. That will remain true into the future. Parklets are a public amenity, a public space, and so we want to ensure that the costs are as low as possible for any community members who are looking to host a parklet. In terms of our street cafes, since these are um, operated as a private space, uh, we will be charging select fees for these spaces. So one of these is a meter hooding fee. So any street cafe that's located in a uh, meter parking zone will be required to pay $200 per meter space for the entirety of the season. That's a flat seasonal fee. And just to give a little context, in past years, um, it was a, a flat daily rate fee. And when you multiply that out by a season, it was roughly about four to $5,000 a meter space. So 
This is significantly lower than uh, what it has been in past years, which is really great for just encouraging more of this active use of the space. The second fee listed on here is a safety equipment fee. This is a new fee, um, but something that we are looking to establish with the permanent programs. Um, this will be $500 per street cafe for the season. Um, this fee is really uh, meant to cover material and staff time to install the safety equipment that's needed at each of the street cafe locations, including wheel stops and bollards. Um, something I just want to emphasize is our goal here is to remove as many barriers, cost barriers, um, into this program and um, by being able to bring down these fees to this rate, but also ensuring the success of this, the, this pro program into the future, I think these fees really find a balance of being able to maintain this into the future, but lowering that barrier. Um, with the changes that we're making in this program or with these programs, um, we have updated all of our program materials, um, which are available online for folks to see. Uh, we've also updated the Parklet application process to create a more um, simpler application process for folks um, and a more streamlined process, um, both on the applicant side and the staff side. Um, again, all of those updated materials and information are available online on our Parklet and Street Cafe website. So looking forward, um, we will be implementing these new program requirements and fees for the 2023 season. We are also continuing to explore ways to attract more applicants, um, particularly looking at ways that we can expand our communications and do more targeted outreach to um, areas within the city that maybe don't see as many applicants for these uh, or within these programs. Uh, we're also always looking for ways to improve the applicant resources, making sure that people have what they need to be able to do this successfully. Um, and lastly, I'll just note that we were, even though we're establishing these as permanent programs, we will continue to evaluate them moving forward to make sure that they are remaining relevant and accessible to our community members um, and to help increase participation. So with that, um, that concludes my presentation and I'm happy to stand for any questions. Great, thank you. Do we have any questions or comments? Councilmember Payne. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, first I wanna say I love the parklets. Uh, we had one in my ward last year and it was like, one of my highest attendance open office hour locations. It was just a really great place to meet with constituents. Um, and um, so my question is around the um, the street cafes. And so like a feedback is I really love the safety barrier requirement that there is a little bit of a tension, right, with being that close to the streets and it's good to see that. Um, but I was curious for the street cafes with their commercial use are there SAC charges that could potentially be, have an impact on that as a financial barrier for using it? Yeah, thank you. Chair Johnson, Councilmember Payne. Um, yes, there. so the fees listed in here are changes, particularly just fees that we charge as a city. There are additional fees related to the street cafe program, such as the SAC charges. Um, and then there's also, a, a particularly for street cafes, there's the sidewalk cafe permit fee um, and, um, there's, the, there's a temporary expansion of premises that, I uh, can't remember off the top of my head if there's a fee associated with that, but there's a couple different permits uh, associated specifically with the street cafes. Um, so there, there are some other costs than what was presented here today, but um, these, the meter hooding fee, I think, was probably the biggest financial mm -hmm. barrier to street cafes previously. And then I, I'm just trying to remember, our SAC chart, of those additional fees, I guess, would it be, um, would those be fixed in nature or would they be variable based Variable based on, because I know SAC charges are typically by like number of seats or something to that effect. I'm just trying to wrap my head around, would it be like, here goes your fixed cost for doing a street cafe or is there gonna be some fluctuation to that? Yeah, Chair Johnson, Councilmember Payne, um, that's a great question. I'm not the expert in terms of what those fees are, but I can check in with our uh, my counterpart in CPAD to get that answer. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Vita. Thank you, Chair Johnson. Uh, you know, we had problems in our ward with the amount of parklets that were available in the city. So my question is more around, um, are we gonna have the same amount of parklets that we already had or more? Yeah, thank you, Chair Johnson, uh, Council Member Vita. So we were planning on keeping our same three city-owned parklets um, as we have had over the last seven or eight years. Um, the goal of the update to this program is that we're removing some of those cost barriers and those structural barriers to help encourage people to design their own spaces, create their own spaces. Um, 
the goal of the Parklet program really has always been to be a catalyst for future investment from community members. Um, it's not meant to kind of, ex our role as a city is not meant to expand past that. Um, we're really just trying to help encourage and create that first step for folks to be able to try it out before they make that investment themselves. Yes, I like that um, a lot. And one of the things we heard, I, I appreciate, you know, you really looking at the cost and um, the fees associated with it because the the uh, businesses in Ward 4 that wanted to use it had looked into getting parklets themselves and the price and was extremely high. So they were upset when they couldn't get the city one, of course. And so I really appreciate um, this full overview of, you know, like how we sustain these programs in communities, especially underserved communities. And anything I can do to help you get the word out, because you know last year this was <laughs> this was a big thing. So anything I can do to help you get the word out, rather than share it in our newsletter or send out something to our businesses who have previously used them, please let me know how I can do so, because we want folks to know, you know, how we're moving forward with this, pro this program and how we can uh, support them moving forward as well. So thank you both for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from committee members? Not seeing any, I'll uh, say I really appreciate Councilmember Payne's question around SAC fees. I think that that has certainly historically been a barrier for a lot of businesses activating outdoor spaces. And so uh, certainly maybe something offline, but I'd be curious if there's even just a high level example of we say you've got a small restaurant or cafe and you want to add 10 or 20 seats outside what might they expect in fees um, especially once you factor in SAC and some of these other charges again offline question I'm just curious uh, as we look at that and continuing to try to find ways to uh, help on that front I know we've looked at legislation in the past but putting that aside uh, I just want to say thank you for this presentation both you and Lex I, I think this is really exciting that this is now going to be permanent I remember when I first started on the council when this was a pilot and now it continues to just uh, advance and advance and it's great to see us uh, institutionalizing this so and also really like those safety barriers as well because that's always been something kind of weird when you're sitting out there with traffic whizzing by you and it's like if there's one driver not paying attention and they go into the side of this thing it's game over uh and so it's gonna i think make it a lot more comfortable for folks and put their minds at ease around that so thank you for this not seeing any other comments or questions i will go ahead and without objection direct the clerk to file that report then we'll move on to our final discussion item today, which is adopting the racial equity framework for transportation. Director Anderson Kelleher, who will be presenting on this item? Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. Kathleen Mayle, Supervisor, Transportation Planning. Uh, she is a transportation planner. And Bria Fast, Transportation Planner, Transportation Planning and Programming will be presenting today. Excellent, welcome Kathleen. Good afternoon, Chair Johnson, committee members. Um, Kathleen Mail, Transportation Planning Supervisor in the Transportation Planning and Programming Division. Happy to be back here um, talking about the racial equity framework for uh, adoption. So we're, my colleague Bria Fast and I will talk, um, take you through the last few months from where we've been since we were last here, the public feedback we received and our proposed revisions and next steps with this work. We were at PWI December 1st to present on the draft racial equity framework for transportation. And over the um, course of a couple months, we had a public comment period where we hosted um, a community, I should say the, our community partner, the Cultural Wellness Center and the Community Equity Work Group hosted a Did You Know community meeting in early December. And then we had two virtual open houses. We had an online public comment forum and um, also a series of internal reviews with our different working groups and staff uh, from Public Works. The engagement approach that we prepared and developed throughout this whole process was really um, a deep one with our community partner and the community equity work group that lasted and spanned a lot of 2022, um, where we were, you know, if you're familiar with the spectrum of engagement, we're more on the involve, collaborate, um, end of the spectrum there with people um, that were contributing their time, 
uh, and, and resources to help develop this racial equity framework. We had a lighter touch engagement with the general public through our public open houses and this you know, online public comment forum, more on the informed consult. And, and that showed up in our numbers in terms of how many folks we engaged with, but it was also um, an intentional approach we took with this effort. So just as a quick summary, our draft racial equity framework um, document included all these items for you. Those remain the same. Um, the structure of the document is intact. Uh, we also had a draft equity dashboard that we released at the same time that we are, um, it's not part of the official adoption of the REF, but it is a resource that accompanies the racial equity framework. And two, just highlighting two of the major components, again, for reference, developing our transportation equity priority score. This is the draft um, that was presented in December, which will replace our areas of concentrated poverty with um, greater than 50% people of color uh, as the equity-based, you know, geographic-based equity metric that we use in transportation planning uh, with our newly developed transportation equity priority scoring. And then there were a series of strategies and actions that we also put forth in the plan that really showed our public commitment to where we plan to take this work over the next uh, eight years, aligning with our transportation action plan through 2030, um, identifying the time frame and their level of difficulty around the six, I'm sorry, around the four different goals. I'll hand it over to Bria for the, to take it from here. Thanks. All right, thank you. Welcome. Thank you, Chair Johnson, members of the committee. My name is Bria Fast. I'm a transportation planner in the Transportation Planning and Programming Division of Public Works. So I'm gonna take us through some of the feedback from our public comment period. The public comment period lasted 51 days. It consisted of external and internal opportunities for feedback, the results that I'll share in slides coming up. And this feedback was really important to informing the updates that we made to the draft. The Did You Know community meeting was facilitated by our community equity work group. The format was really unique compared to prior public, en public engagement meetings um, and just engagement in general on a lot of transportation projects. The community equity work group members led the presentation while city staff sat in the audience as well as other community members. They took people through the REF, but they also spoke broadly about the impacts of transportation in their lives through personal testimony, stories, and even song. They expressed pride and ownership over the work and concluded with a call to action, to hold the city accountable to the actions outlined in the REF, but also to hold the community accountable to continuing to stay engaged with the work moving forward. There were two virtual open houses. This slide summarizes the themes we heard from the questions and comments at these events. We'll address many of these themes in subsequent slides, including some of the tangible outcomes of the REF and the impact of the TEP score. A feedback form was also online during our public comment period. This form asked a series of questions that allowed people to provide feedback on what they liked about the REF, where they saw room for improvement, and what else they wanted to see included on the transportation equity dashboard. Overall, respondents expressed appreciation for multiple ways that the REF was being communicated, so through our document and the dashboard. Um, and also a note is that comments that were disparaging to city staff and specific groups of people have not been included. Next, I'll spend some time going into more detail about what changed from the draft REF to today. Updates to the document that were made in response to feedback fall into three big categories that you can see on this slide. A new section was added to the document to take a closer look at current transportation inequities. Visual improvements were made to improve legibility and more technical changes were made to the TEP score. One theme that continued to pop up in our engagement during the comment period was a request for more clarity around what some of the tangible outcomes of the REF would be or how would residents notice changes on their streets based on this work. The REF is going to make an impact on projects, plans, and programs citywide. To name just a few examples, it'll help guide which projects are selected, it'll be folded into upcoming plan updates like the 20-year streets funding plan, 
will be used to provide um, new ways to analyze data for the Vision Zero Action Plan, and the TEP score will replace ACP50, which will have an impact on all three of these areas. We also made changes to the language in two actions under the lead with a racial equity approach goal. And this was to move from more passive language to more active language. And um, so we added to encourage as well as support in actions 2.5 and 3.2. Next, I'm gonna share some of the changes that we made, or I will share all of the changes that we made to the transportation equity priority or the TEP score. But first, I'm gonna give a quick overview and reminder of what that score is. The TEP score will replace ACP 50. However, unlike ACP50, the TEP score is made up of five different tiers, which avoids that in or out binary. On our maps, the darkest purple represents the highest priority areas. This score is made up of eight different data sets. These eight data sets are divided into two different subscores, and we call these base equity and equity plus. Base equity is made up of half of these data sets, and all of them are related to race and income. Equity plus is made up of the other half of this data, and these are all data sets specifically related to transportation. This score is going to be included in the forthcoming update to the 20 Year Streets funding plan, and it will impact how we develop our capital improvement program. Since the release of the draft, we have made changes to the TEP score. When census data became available for 2021, we updated the data in the TEP score. In doing so, we noticed there were census tracts that shifted multiple tiers. Although some shifts in tiers are inedible, <laughs> inevitable, as demographics and census tracts evolve and change, the goal is to have a score that's resilient to big fluctuations over time. In order to provide more stability, we adjusted the points received for certain thresholds. To use the example that you're looking at on the slide, this means that if the percentage of residents of color in a census tract changed from, say, 26% to 24% in one year, the overall TEP score would change now by 20 points instead of 30 points. So that's one-third of the possible points compared to one-half of the possible points. Another change that helps with overall stability is increasing or widening some of those um, point ranges in the tiers. So this is gonna help contribute to fewer big changes in tiers from year to year. These changes led to a TEP score that is far more resistant to big fluctuations and is overall a more effective planning tool. These maps show a progression of the TEP score from the release of the draft using 2020 data to what the final TEP score looks like with 2021 data, as well as the technical changes I just talked about. Finally, in addition to the changes we made to the TEP score to provide more long-term stability, we also adjusted the relative weight of the subscores. Where base equity and equity plus previously had been equally weighted, you can see that on the diagram on the left, each had 100 points. Our final version has a two to one ratio. So base equity remained at 100 points and equity plus is now 50 points. So all of those equity plus data sets were reduced by half. These maps show the changes from again that one to one ratio and where we are now with the two to one ratio. While, that equity, while the equity score components, they play a really big role in adding nuance and depth to the way in which transportation projects, plans, and programs consider equity, the weighting of the TEP score is now designed so that the final score is more responsive to those base equity factors. So this results in a final score that still takes transportation data into consideration while prioritizing race and income factors. Close out the presentation, sharing here the Bicycle Advisory Committee's resolution on this work. Um, largely, the Bicycle Advisory Committee was appreciative and, and positive about the work. Um, a couple questions that we hope we've addressed through the updates that Bria just walked through um, related to how this informs our capital improvement program and where this lines up in terms of our 20-year streets funding plan and so on. 
Um, that they talk about tracking indicators as well, and there are um, five different tracking indicators that we plan to report back on uh, every two years as a part of the TAP report back where we do disaggregate data by race. The Pedestrian Advisory Committee did not pass a resolution. I think that was primarily due to um, you know, weather, canceling events, inability to make it in in the time frame. They were aware of the work and um, we had gone before our December release of the draft to the Pedestrian Advisory Committee. So in terms of our next steps, we are working on some of those year one action items already and um, we would plan to report back to Council December of 2024 at our next uh, TAP report back. Drew Schmitz, who's not here today, has been an integral part of the team along with Bree and I, so thanks to him and happy to answer any questions anyone may have. All right, thank you so much for that presentation. I'll see if we have any comments or questions from committee members. Councilmember Wansley. Thank you, Chair Johnson. Um, I first just wanna thank our staff so much for their work on this framework. Um, it's absolutely a critical need and first major step in ensuring that the city is held accountable in its promises to equity um, and being able to travel to work, school, or a grocery store, even a pharmacy uh, within a reasonable and affordable timeline um, is not a privilege that should just be afforded to the wealthy or those who own cars. Um, and our s zip codes have you know, help to really shape, I think, the framework of, of what you presented to us today um, and making sure that our city and our communities are becoming more transit friendly and that racial justice is at the core of that. Um, with that said, you know, my office has been in communications with uh, the race equity and inclusion in belonging, hashtag R EIB uh, departments in regards to their input on this process. And I want to provide some uh, context to the amendment that I've brought forward um, that is in front of council members. Um, on page 36, um, titled Build Organizational Empathy Strategy 4, there are two actions. Um, I support these actions fully, but believe you know that we can fully realize our, the, the racial equity transportation framework um, within a, a shorter timeline um, than what is being proposed. So after having conversations with Public Works and team members within the REIB department, I'm bringing for one amendment to slightly change the timeline for action 4.1, uh, which will change it to one year. Um, RI, oh Lord, these acronyms, the REIB is continuing to work uh, on the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, and that work complements uh, action 4.1 one in defining racial justice. So I feel confident that staff can have a workable uh, definition to help guide this work by the end of this year. Um, I also want to recognize that this definition may shift over the next few years based off of new type of engagement that, you know, the Public Works Department is going to be doing um, towards employing this new framework. So um, I want to uh, now make the motion uh, for this amendment to be considered. So I will first move approval of this item, and then uh, Councilmember Wansley is making a motion to amend this item, and I will see if there is any discussion on that, uh, or if Public Works staff have anything on that. Mr. Chair and committee members, we are in support of Councilmember Wansley's amendment. All right, thank you. I'll give it a second. Uh, all right, uh, so... Uh, we have that motion before us. Councilmember Vita. Thank you, Chair Johnson. I'm in support as well, but I talked with uh, Councilmember Wansley's staff yesterday, and I was told that the, uh, the REIB department had agreed to two years um, to have this done. So has there been, j just to the motion maker, has there been conversations about the now one-year timeline? Councilman uh, Wansley. Yeah, thank you, Chair Johnson. I'm sorry if there was miscommunication. We've spoken with REIB as of early as Tuesday around the one-year timeline, and there was support for that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Uh, any other comments or questions on this item? I, okay, Councilman Payne. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I think I said this when you came before us in December and just how impactful this was for me. And it's just really great to see, like, like I'm just trying to be very clear that there's a lot of academic conversation about systemic racism, but this is like very tangible. This should 
translate to what dollars are invested where. It's literally where the rubber meets the road when it comes to anti-racist actions of a of an institution. And I just want to uplift that as like we're we're talking about this in our transportation planning, but this is something that we should think about how it applies to all aspects of uh, the racial equity work that we need to do as a city. So thank you. Thank you, council member. And I'll just speak on the underlying motions. Well, I just really want to thank you, Ms. Mayle and Ms. Fass for all of your work on this. I know uh, you've put so much thought and care into this as is very apparent and, uh, and it's uh, really uh, important, critical work to how we make our investments in our decisions in the city and just really appreciate all of the effort that has gone into this uh, to bring us to this point today. Thank you. Thank you. So not seeing any other comments or questions. First, I'll take up a voice vote on the amendment. All those in approval signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. That motion carries. And now we'll turn to the amended underlying motion. All those in uh, approval of this item, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. The ayes have it, and the committee's recommendation will be forwarded to next week's council meeting for final action. And with that, we've concluded all business to come before this committee, and without objection, we stand adjourned. Thank you.